you will hear two people organizing a going away party for a mutual friend. First, you have some time to look at questions one to four. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to four. Hey Bruce, looks like we got some planning to do for Albert's going away party, right? There are certainly some things we have to talk about now. Yeah, that's better than doing everything at the last minute. Okay, so I can write some notes as we talk. Sure thing. So, when should we have the party? Hmm. He goes to Thailand on the twenty sixth of August. Okay. Let's have it on the twenty fourth then. Yes. Let me see. That's a Friday. That'd be perfect. Now, where should we have it? At a bar or a club? You know, I think he would like something really intimate. Nothing too loud. A restaurant would be good. Maybe the Apple Tree Grill. Great place. Sounds good. Okay. Now we have to think about who to invite. Well, his best friend from college. Sure. And his cousins, right? Oh yes, his co-workers. Yeah, okay, his co-workers and his boss. Any other people? How about his yoga classmates? Hmm, he does love yoga, but that might be too many people. I suppose so. I can email and text message the invitations. When should I send them? We should send them out soon, but not too early. How about the sixteenth of August then? Well, why not give it a few more days? The thirteenth? All right, I think that's a good time too. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions five to ten. Now listen and answer questions five to ten. Okay, now we have to think of a gift. Should we all get one? No, I was thinking we could all give money for the party and the gift. You know, something really nice. Yeah, that'd be better than getting him little things individually. I can ask for the money. Thanks for doing that. How much should we ask for? I think we should ask for maybe fifteen dollars each. Is that too much? No, not at all. He's going away for two years. That would give us about one hundred and fifty dollars. That's a good amount. Yeah, well, I'm thinking we could get him something practical. Yes, especially since he's going abroad. Something he could use. Something that's also portable. We could get him an article of clothing, perhaps, or maybe even a pair of shoes. Hmm. Shoes are nice, but they might wear out easily, especially where he's going. Maybe a book light. A what? Yeah, he loves to read, and a book light would be very convenient when he travels. Okay, that's one good gift idea. Did you write that down? Yep. Now we need to think about reservations at the restaurant. Well, we should get their big banquet room, yeah. Yes, definitely. Should we ask the restaurant to prepare a buffet? Isn't that expensive? No, I don't think it is. A buffet dinner sounds cheaper than everyone ordering individual meals. Definitely. How about drinks? They can buy drinks themselves or bring their own. Okay. Yeah, it would cost too much if we bought drinks ourselves. Certainly. We have to ask someone to bring an MP3 player. The restaurant has speakers, and we can hook it up for music. Sounds good. Actually, there is one more thing that I thought we should do since Albert is leaving for such a long time. What were you thinking of? Maybe we could have a slideshow of all the fun times we've had. Hmm. 
That'll take a little bit of work, but I think it's a great idea. Actually, in the invitation, can you ask for some photos people have of him? Yeah, definitely. I can scan them, or people can send me digital photos they have. All right. I'll tell them when I send out the invitations. Then I can make a little presentation. Ha! <laughs> I can't wait to see his reaction. Yeah, especially that one picture where. You now have half a minute to check your answers. You will hear a representative from Dreamtime Tours giving information about a particular tour option. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 14. Listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 14. Dreamtime Tours have just the tour for you. The one I have chosen to talk to you about today is what I consider our best tour. It will take you from coast to mountain and back again. You'll spend a memorable and very comfortable day traveling in air-conditioned luxury. You'll see from our brochure that we have four pickup stops along the coast, and about twenty minutes after we pick up our last passenger for the day, we'll be stopping off briefly at a magnificent housing development, marina, and shopping complex. You'll be able to admire some of the most expensive and lavish houses on the coast, and here we'll take a quick walk around the waterfront. Now, despite its name, Hope Island, we can reach it without getting our feet wet or taking a boat ride. Hope Island is connected to the mainland by bridges. From there, we head inland to the beautiful Tambourine Mountain. You'll have time to browse in the many specialty shops, or you can sit and relax at a friendly outdoor cafe. We board the bus again and pass through an old timber milling town on our way to O'Reilly's Green Mountains. Once there, you might wish to venture across the famous treetop walk, which is a bridge suspended in the canopy of a rainforest. Definitely not for the faint-hearted. If you're not up to the excitement of this walk, or perhaps after you've done it, why not enjoy lunch on the balcony of O'Reilly's Restaurant? Before we leave, you'll have time for a stroll through the botanical gardens, or perhaps you'd like to feed the beautiful parrots and other birds. We'll supply the bird seed. From O'Reilly's, we travel to an alpaca farm for a demonstration, and, of course, there'll be a photo opportunity for you with these gorgeous animals before returning to the coach for the journey back to your original departure point. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 15 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 15 to 20. If I've persuaded any of you to sign up for this tour, take a look at our Dreamtime Tours brochure. You'll see that you can book over the telephone, or you can make reservations through the reception desk. 
We generally have a member of staff manning the desk from 7.30 a.m. to 9 p.m. every day of the week. Don't hesitate to ask reception staff any questions that you might have about this tour or any other tour, and be sure to make it known if you have any special needs. We'll do our best to make your trip rewarding and worthwhile. If this is the tour you want, be sure to specify Green Mountain Tour and note that these excursions are full day tours on three days of the week only Sunday, Monday, and Friday. Although we're hoping to have a Saturday tour available by next year, you'll see that fares are extremely reasonable, with each adult paying just $37. Now, that's not bad for a trip of around 280 kilometers, is it? If you want to bring the family, obviously the family pass is great value at $94. That includes two adults and two children. But if you're an older adult, over 65, in other words, a senior citizen, your fare is discounted too. You'll pay a bit less than the full adult rate. Please note the departure times. We adhere to these strictly. The coach will leave the southernmost point of Kulangata at 10 to 8 sharp, travel through Burleigh, and on to Surfer's Paradise, which is our most popular pickup point, departing from there at half past eight in the morning. At a quarter to nine, we make our last pickup at Labrador. May I remind you to dress appropriately for the day? Ladies, no high heels, please. Comfortable walking shoes are what is required, and I always recommend that everyone takes a light jacket because the mountain air can be quite cool compared to the heat and humidity of the coastal regions. Oh, something else I should remind you of. The prices quoted in the brochure are just for coach travel. Although we can arrange for a minibus to collect you from your accommodation and bring you to the departure point free of charge. If you want to avail yourself of this service, be sure to let the booking clerk know. You will need to bring along extra cash or a credit card to cover expenses such as optional side trips, food and drink, and, of course, entrance fees to the various attractions. Well, that's all I have time to tell you. If you have further inquiries, please use the phone number on the brochure. You now have half a minute to check your answers. You will hear a conversation between two students. Who will discuss a project they're working on together? You have 30 seconds to look at questions 21 to 27. Hey, Jess. Glad you could make it. We've got a lot to discuss. Hi, Matt. Yes, sorry I'm a bit late. I did bring all my notes with me. Yes, me too. Where shall we start? Well, I think it would be a good idea to clarify our objectives just one more time. Yes, good idea. Okay, here we are. We need to record, photograph, and identify the plant species in 10 one square meter plots. Does it say anything about where these plots should be and how they should be laid out? Ah, here it is. It says that all the plots need to be no more than 10 metres apart. And how do we choose them? Ah, this is the fun part. I remember this. Here we are. Make a one metre square frame using bamboo sticks available from the department stores. Yes, we've, we've already done that. I know, I'm just reading the whole section. Okay. One person stands roughly in the middle of the chosen area and throws the frame. The other person uses a tape to mark out the square where the frame landed and returns frame 
to thrower. The thrower then turns a few degrees on the spot and throws again. The thrower must turn slightly after each throw and vary the force of the throw until after the tenth throw they are pointing in almost the same direction as the first. That sounds a bit complicated. That's only because it's all in writing. It's just a simple throw, turn, throw, turn, throw, turn until we have ten squares. And I guess you want to do the throwing. Well, if you don't mind. I'm sure you'll be more accurate at marking the squares. Yes, I am sure I am, and I'm sure you've got a stronger throwing arm. You now have 30 seconds to look at questions 28 to 30. OK, good. We've got that sorted. Now we need to decide where to go. Yes, I've been thinking about that and I've brought the map. Ah, well done. I forgot mine. Now, I've identified three possible locations, but they've all got some disadvantages. OK, fire away. Well, the area around this lowland marsh could be interesting. There'll be a lot of interesting water plants here. Looks good. But what's the problem? Mainly that it's already a designated nature reserve, and I think there's already been a lot of research done here. Ah, I see. Well, I'd rather do something that's new and can be useful. I agree. That's why I identified this area further west. See, here, behind the beach. Oh yes, I see. That area there, where it's flat, but quite high. Exactly. If you look a bit further inland, you'll see that there are hills which will protect that area from strong north winds. I see. Excellent. But what's the problem? Just that it may not be very interesting. We know that the geology there is not conducive to a wide variety of plants. Mm, I agree. So what's your last idea? Well, I think this one is a bit of a winner, although I did want to show you the other two. Look up here, on the north coast. Where? See, this bay? Well, I know that there's been quite a lot of studies done here, but a bit further to the east, behind this headland. No one has ever looked at that. Well, I certainly couldn't see any studies. That is interesting. And the plant life could be a bit different because of the shelter from the wind the headland provides. Exactly. Brilliant, Jessica. That's a great idea. We'll go there. Thanks. Now all we have to decide is when is a good time. Well... You will hear a lecturer discussing techniques for removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 33. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 33. We all know about the role of carbon dioxide in causing global warming. Obviously, society needs to reduce the release of carbon dioxide, otherwise known as CO2. This gas comes from the burning of fossil fuels, such as coal and oil, and it is virtually impossible for society to prevent or even limit such activity. Our need for energy and power is just too great. Instead, a more practical idea is to collect the carbon dioxide from the burning process for example, directly from the chimneys of power stations, and somehow prevent this gas from being released into the environment. To do that, you need to store it somehow, and that has to be essentially forever. 
It is perhaps for this reason that many believe that, rather than storing the carbon dioxide as a gas, it is better to react it with metal oxides, such as magnesium or calcium, which results in the formation of a hard carbonate material. The gas is, in effect, turned into a stable and unreactive solid, which can simply be dumped anywhere. This process actually occurs naturally, although very, very slowly, and is one cause of the surface limestone in the world. But this slow reaction speed is the problem. Even when enhancing this process through high temperature and pressure, or pretreatment of the mineral, it is still far too slow to be economical. One other technique which has been suggested is to pump the gas to the bottom of the ocean, where it would react with compounds in the seawater, forming carbonic acid. However, this alternative has now been ruled out. The CO2 may be removed from the atmosphere, but the high oceanic acidity which would result raises its own set of problems, mostly with all the delicate life and the intricate food chains in the seawater, some on which we ourselves depend. And that's something which no one wants to experiment with. Before you hear the rest of the lecture, you have some time to look at questions 34 to 40. Now listen and answer questions 34 to 40. Perhaps because of the lack of alternatives, the most commonly discussed solution to the problem of disposing of carbon dioxide is to pump the gas underground, a technique known as geosequestration. In this system, the CO2, for example, could be pumped into underground pockets within depleted oil wells or disused coal tunnels. This carries, however, three serious disadvantages. Namely, the risk of leaks, the considerable costs involved, and finally, the unproven effectiveness. Let us look at those three disadvantages in detail. Firstly, there is the risk of leaks. Although the gas would be deep and sealed over by masses of rock and earth, the huge pressures in these spaces would turn the gas into a liquid state, capable of moving through rock fissures or faults. This could allow the gas to eventually be released to the surface. Since CO2 is heavier than air, and thus pushes oxygen aside, such leaks could result in the suffocation of thousands, or tens of thousands of people, certainly not a consequence to be taken lightly. Natural CO2 leakage from volcanic build-up has already witnessed such deadly events. The other problem of geosequestration is the cost. The time and effort spent on materials and construction, primarily the pipework through which the gas would travel, does not come cheaply. So, if this system were to be implemented in, say, coal-fired power plants, the extra cost would have to be paid by the electricity user, whose bills would almost double as a consequence. Few people are prepared to pay this much simply to make a small dent on the effects of global warming. And this leads to the final problem. The most basic question is whether geosequestration actually reduces global warming. The problem here is that the energy needed to create and drive the sequestration process would require approximately a quarter of a coal-fired electricity plant's output. In other words, the plant would have to burn one quarter more of its coal just to account for the sequestration of the carbon dioxide. And with coal producing other noxious pollutants, such as sulphur, ash and heavy metals, the environment is hardly benefited at all. Nevertheless, there are many active experimental efforts underway, primarily in oil production sites. These are small, but intensively monitored and analysed. All we can say now is that the jury is still out on whether underground carbon storage will one day be feasible. You now have half a minute to check your answers.